And, and then um, once each of the panelists have introduced themselves, we will move on and open up the floor for questions from our attendees. So first we have Krista Sear. We have Dr. Ginger Gottschall, Dr. Liz Shao Wexler, and Dr. Sahana Kuke. So I'll turn it over first to Krista to introduce herself. Okay, hello everyone. Kicking it off, I'm Krista. Um, thank you for the introduction and thank you for having me. I'm very excited to be here. Um, so my background, um, I graduated, got my master's degree from the University of Kansas in 2014 with um, a degree in biomechanical engineering. I did my undergrad there as well in mechanical. Um, in that time, they didn't really have a biomechanics focus as widely available for undergrad as they do now, which is great that that's um, becoming more available. So then went into uh, my master's degree to focus on biomechanical engineering. Um, and now I've been working at the Center for Limb Loss and Mobility at the Seattle VA for almost 10 years, about nine years now. Um, and kind of the structure of our center here, um, we have a director, a couple of associate directors, and then several principal investigators uh, made up of clinicians, surgeons, research career scientists. Um, most of our principal investigators are also um, professors, associate, or otherwise um, at the University of Washington. So we collaborate um, with the University of Washington and have a lot of graduate students, um, a few undergrads as well, helping us um, with several of our projects. Um, so under each principal investigator is a team of researchers and some students, as I mentioned. So um, I'm a research engineer under Dr. Glenn Cludy here, um, who is now actually the director of our center. So he's been at the center for the, since it's been open. Um, we, at our center, we focus mostly on lower limb um, research, so um, we do kind of the preventative side of um, trying to prevent amputations and kind of that kind of research. And then also the treatment side after an amputation has occurred, um, which is where I focus on mostly is prosthetics um, research. So on lower limb amputees, typically we work with a uh, transtibial, uh, transfemoral aren't as common, which is above the knee. Um, but we, so we typically have trans tibial below the knee amputees. We do um, different kinds of studies looking at improving their prosthetic, their prosthesis um, either at the ankle um, or inside the socket or just kind of a variety of studies with that. Um, so I help oversee and assist in project design which can include um, helping write parts of grants and IRB uh, documents to get our human subjects research approved. Um, that's the International Review Board. Um, oh, sorry, Internal Review Board. Um, and then I help with uh, data, all the data collection in our gate lab and then analyzing all the data and then dissemination of that, usually in journal manuscripts. Um, and then I was part of my job within the past 10 years. I've also um, came on as our gate lab manager. So our motion analysis or gate lab, we kind of use that interchangeably. Um, I just help manage. We have, since we have several principal investigators and several groups using our, all of our different lab spaces, but including the motion analysis lab, um, I'm kind of the point person for all the equipment, um, making sure everyone's using everything correctly. I run a training session about once a year to make sure everyone knows how to use all of our equipment. So we have motion capture cameras, we have in-ground force plates, um, instrumented treadmills, EMG, we have a COSMED system, might be forgetting something, but um, yeah, so lots of equipment, just helping making sure everything's up and running correctly. Um, and then, I know I'm running out of time trying to do this quickly, but um, just a few of our projects of note. So we've looked at um, 
coronally uneven terrain um, for amputees, so stepping on a coronally uneven surface. Um, one of our graduate students um, developed a prosthesis ankle that could adjust as you step on that surface um, in the coronal plane. And so seeing if that was helpful. Um, and then we've also recently done a load carriage study. Um, so having amputees wear a load on the front, the back, and carrying it on each side and kind of seeing their biomechanics as they walk. Um, we also had them walk with five different prosthet prosthetic feet that are currently on the market and seeing how the load affects their walking while they wear those different feet. So that's a quick introduction to me. Um, and then hopefully we'll have some questions. Thank you. Thank you, Krista. Um, we'll turn it over to Dr. Ginger Gottschall now. Thank you so much. It's really tricky to follow that impactful intro. Thank you, Krista. <laughs> My name is Ginger and I started this crazy biomechanics journey as an undergrad at the University of Colorado Boulder, where I was competing in triathlons and really wanted to understand why running after you got off the bike was 10,000 times harder than when you just went for a run. So that is where the gears started turning with respect to, is there a way that I could actually study this and gain some understanding about what the differences are? So as an undergrad project, I just had a bunch of my buddies take their bikes to a track and then get off and run and compare that to a run run condition. And that's where my curiosity and passion and appreciation for the field and for the people that were doing research started. At that point, I decided I'd like to actually make this into something and knew from a very early stage that I wanted to go into academia. So I received master's degree in biomechanics continuing on with my triathlon research and then continued with a PhD in who I still consider to be the best mentor in the world, Professor Roger Crom, who if you haven't met him, I hope you have the opportunity someday in life. He is a absolute joy and the most curious and thoughtful and kind, helpful mentor ever. The curious part is where he did such wonders for me in terms of biomechanics and the kind and patient part came into really, I was his first female PhD student. And from the day I started with him until now, he's still the best advocate for women in the discipline. So really special when you meet that mentor that can assist you and be your cheerleader the whole time. Following my PhD, it was all mechanics, a little bit of physiology. I did some metabolic cost data, but primarily studied the mechanics of locomotion, both walking and running uphill and downhill. After graduating, thinking about what my next step would be, knowing that it was going to be academia, I decided to do a postdoc in neuroscience and neurophys because I honestly, at that point, I didn't even know what a motor neuron really was and how it all worked in terms of how a muscle contracts. So postdoc at the University of Emory in Atlanta, and there was a joint work with other universities in the area, but I was primarily working with Richard Nichols, who talk about another mentor who advocates for women and allows you to really take your passions to the max is him. From there, I went to my first real job and I was over 30 years old. My parents thought it was about time and was an assistant professor at the Pennsylvania State University where biomechanics kind of started, to be honest, in the US in the water tower there on campus where individuals would literally be running in a very small circle. The history of biomechanics start of ISB actually was at Penn State and 
that is also where the primary studies were done by Kavanaugh with, with running, distance running specifically. So it was really incredible to be a part of that history of the science and be in those labs and that space. So many amazing researchers in that department still. I continued on with biomechanics through tenure and at the time that I was putting in my paperwork, decided that I'd like to switch into a little bit more of an applied field and had started consulting for industry. And this is one thing I would love to encourage women in the discipline is to never be afraid to do some side work, get to know different companies in the industry because you are a huge asset to them with respect to your education and knowledge and helping them push forward their innovation, their research outside of academia. So little side gigs I was doing, and one of them was for a company called Les Mills International, which is a group fitness company. So during that second half of my time at Penn State, after I had tenure, I started doing more consulting for them, started applying for some of their internal grant mechanisms to do research, and then began to realize there is another side to impactful research outside of the university. And thought I might want to try that at some point. Got a full-time position with Les Mills actually in New York City in collaboration with Columbia. And then we had this thing called COVID, which threw everything off with respect to studies that you could do, bringing people into the lab. And then I needed to pivot again to make sure I could still stay in this discipline that I loved. And I had been outside of the university. So finding another outside entity. Got a position as the director of sports research at Wahoo Fitness. They are predominantly cycling focused and they produce products that are bike computers, bike trainers. They used to have a watch and ran their science research group. After I'd been there for almost three years, a friend from grad school emailed me a job ad for New Balance that they were looking for a director of science to replace an individual who I'd actually known and gone through grad school with. He maintained all of his work in Massachusetts, Trampas, Tenbrook. And I just thought this position sounds so much like something I've dreamed of that I just have to give it a shot. So it was literally a year ago last week that I had my in-person interview at New Balance and they had just opened a new facility. I walked into the facility and honestly started sweating and had some sort of physical reaction to the fact that a place like this existed. It is. It has a Mondo track a tennis court, a basketball court, a whole turf that you can do lacrosse, baseball, American and global football, and mechanical testing. I'm in the athlete insights room where we do interviews with folks. So really, really wanted this gig and super fortunate, got it somehow. And now it has been a year of, let me be honest, complete chaos totally in over my head every day still is like please let me just hold on and try not to bring anybody a step back from where they're going forward but it is it's really a joy and a challenge and a I love the team here they are all masters PhD level in biomechanics it is 70 percent women in the lab so really a motivating and special place to be. And part of my want here is to also be more of an educational brand and bring the science and the data and the smart training and the how to be safe and happy all at once while you're moving. So thank you. Thank you. And then um, we'll turn it over to Dr. Liz Shaw-Wexler. 
Oh, okay. So, wow, Ginger, that was impressive. All the different things you've been doing since last I saw you. <laughs> so I knew Ginger when she was a grad student yeah. and I was an assistant professor. So I've been, I'm at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. I have been here now 22 years since I started it as an assistant professor. Um, so I'll go backwards in time. Um, so I did my undergraduate master's and PhD all in mechanical engineering. Um, between my my bachelor's and my PhD, I, I worked for Xerox uh, as a engineer doing a variety of different things. Um, partly I was a Xerox because I went into medicine, went into engineering because I wanted to go to medical school mm -hmm. and engineers had the highest acceptance rate. So I was playing my odds. But then when I was a senior, I realized, wow, I spent all this time being coming an engineer. I thought I should try it out for a little bit. Um, and I so I went and got a job with Xerox who had given me a summer internship. And while there, I was super lucky and they put me through my master's. Um, and for my master's project, originally I was doing foot and ankle work with a surgeon who then left. Uh, and then I ended up doing research on ski boot, boot, ski boot, ski boot and binding and boot design and how it affects the forces uh, to release you out of your bindings and not get injured. Um, which made me go, I really do not want to work on copiers and printers for the rest of my life. I really want to get back into bioengineering. So the same week that I put in my resignation, I submitted my master's thesis and I drove across country to go to uh, University of California, Berkeley in mechanical engineering. Um, there, I originally was going to do research in skiing, biomechanics, um, but then well, skiing and I guess control of automated ski bindings to release you. And then I said, can I ever get a job doing research on skiing? Uh, and I was like, this seems a little wor worrisome. So I ended up with another professor, Steve Rabinovich, who was a new assistant professor in orthopedic surgery at University of California, San Francisco, which is the medical school. And he was a bioengineering um, doing uh, bioengineer in the orthopedic surgery department and his PhD that he had done at Harvard and MIT in their health technology program, he had created these hip pads to prevent older adults from injuring and fracturing their hips. So originally my PhD work was thinking about falling and originally tried to make people fall down and understand how they fell. It's one of the few research studies because it's done in the 90s where we were able to get IRB approval to actually make people fall and impact. Luckily, we did make them fall on um, foam mats. And I made my own markers my, out of little cat toys that were foam balls and created my own little markers so that when they did fall, they didn't hurt themselves. Through that study, we realized um, people don't really want to fall. So we were trying to pull the floor out from underneath them and make them fall. And so you can see this paper that's really well documented, uh, cited now because it's one of the few where we make people fall. And we notice people don't want to fall and they try running um, to, or try stepping to keep their balance. So then my other studies were looking at stumbling approaches and, and methods for not preventing yourself from falling. Um, which then led me into my postdoc. So here's a little bit of history. Back in the day in the 90s, late 90s, the internet was a new thing. And I went to this um, um, uh, sweet Society of Women Engineers activity. And they had said, hey, you should put your CV up on the web. <clears throat> And this would be a really cool new thing to do. So I did. And then on BioMechL, which is, if you don't know it, you should get on it. It's a listserv of biomechanics. So in BioMechL, there was a posting at your Boston University. And they said, we got this postdoc opportunity in this integrated rehabilitation engineering uh, program. It was 
supported by NIDLR, which is the national, well, at the time, it was National Institute of Disability Related Research. Oh, actually, it wasn't called NIDLR then. It's at NIDLR now. Anyways, it was an opportunity with three PIs. Um, one was Jim Collins at Boston University in bioengineering, Casey, Ger Casey Kerrigan, who's a physiatrist or a PM and N doctor at uh, Spalding Rehab Hospital in Boston, and Lou Lipsitz, who was a uh, geriatrics medicine and the head of geriatric medicine at Harvard Medical School. So I sent them an email that just said, hey, can you tell me a little bit about this position? And by the way, my CV is on the web and you can look at it. Um, I got an email immediately back that says, congratulations, we accept you into this postdoc. <laughs> so, so I was really fortunate and got to drive across the country, start a postdoc in Boston. Meanwhile, I was pregnant um, with my first son um, and arrived in April, gave birth in September. And since two out of the three PIs were young and had new kids themselves, they gave me three months off maternity leave um, to raise, to take care of my son. Um, while there, I, I, I learned about a bunch of other things because I had three PIs to report to. One was interested in the effect of Tai Chi on balance and gait. The other one uh, was looking at the effects of ankle foot orthoses and maybe being able to provide some sort of assistance to these passive devices. At the time, we were only thinking of elastic members to, to put in support. And um, another was just looking at overall postural control and methodologies for assessing postural control. Uh, I landed in the middle of the country at, um, at the uh, University of Illinois, um, have been there, as I said, for 22 years. My research has gone from biomechanics, looking at gait and balance and coming up with new metrics for quantifying gait and balance as sort of long-term time analyses. Then we moved into wheelchair propulsion biomechanics, utilize a lot of those um, things that, so being at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, I no longer had a medical school or real medical school around me because at UCSF and of course Harvard Medical School, I was really in heavily entrenched um, institutions that have well-known research in medicine and biomedical problems. When I came here, pretty much it was just our hospital systems. And we had a medical school, but it's really the first two classes of that school. Um, and not and they really didn't want to do research. So all my doctors, I just always asked them, like, anybody want to do a research project with me? And when I was pregnant with my second son, two years into my junior professor position, I asked my OBGYN, who happened to also be pregnant, um, if she wanted to do something. And we ended up doing a research study looking at the effect of balance and stance width and your perception of your balance um, with pregnant women across uh, across their pregnancy and up to six months postpartum. So I've done work on dogs and firefighters, uh, pregnant women, wheelchair athletes, because we have a very strong wheelchair athletics program. My work has moved more and more towards um, actually robotics. And our latest school project is related to a ball-based wheelchair. We just presented this at ASB. So think of BB-8, um, the robot from Star Wars, or if you know Nickelodeon's Avatar, The Last Airbender and how he rides on a ball of air, you literally sit on a ball, you lean your body in the direction that you want to go. And, and that's how we're driving it. Um, I Just a few other tidbits. So I've been super fortunate to have been mentored well um, and advocated well. So mentoring is important, but advocation is also important to having people supporting you. As a consequence, I've been very fortunate and I was the program chair for ASB in 2012. I was um, nominated and elected to be a fellow of ASB in 2018. And then I was the, in the presidential line of ASB from 20. 2020 to 2023. Um, also a fellow of 
um, American Society of Mechanical Engineers. So it's really important um, for those of you thinking about academia, there's our three pillars of research, teaching, and service, um, getting out there and doing service to the professional society, both as a, um, a reviewer for journals and reviewers for grants are very important and really helpful for you. Um, and then being involved in the professional society and trying to do some sort of leadership or activities um, is also great for giving back. Even those, especially ASB, we're also looking for industry um, partners to continue being part of the leadership. So I think I checked my boxes. I had checked the boxes on the IWB membership of LGBTQ in plus in biomechanics and parents in biomechanics. So if you have questions of those, let me know. Thanks. Thank you. That was really cool. Um, and then we'll hear from Dr. Sahana Kuke. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, it's really nice to be here. Great to hear from the other panelists before. Um, maybe there's going to be some of what I say that you hear echoes from what you've just heard. Um, there are little pieces that probably are similar across our pads, but um, you'll also notice some big differences. Um, uh, anyway, uh, so my name is Sahana Kuke, and um, I am right now a program leader at the National Institutes of Health in the office of the director. There's an office of strategic coordination, which manages the common fund. So I don't know if you all have heard about that um, before, but it's a set of money that NIH spends on trans NIH activities. So it covers um, topics that really are not disease specific. Um, they cross um, interests of the different NIH institutes. Um, and so they're housed in the office of the director because they, they do cross over different mission boundaries, but all within the NIH mission. So um, I've been at this role for about a year, but I'm gonna uh, start back um, at the beginning like the other speakers have too, just to give you a sense of how I ended up getting here. Um, and though I don't work with biomechanics specifically right now, that is where I started. So there is some uh, relationship here too. Um, so I guess I um, chose to go to college for biomedical engineering. Um, it was a relatively new major for undergrads at the time. It was 1995 when I went to college um, and I ended up going to Northwestern. Uh, because uh, it was the furthest school I got into from home. So that was like my big deciding factor. Um, I grew up in New Jersey. I love my family very much, but I, I felt like going somewhere. So Illinois, um, I went to Northwestern and um, it was a terrific experience. I, I had picked biomedical engineering very simply because I love math and I was interested in, in you know, medical sciences and, and health, and it just seemed like um, made for made for that. So I went. Um, and it wasn't really, I mean, I just I just went to college and I did it. I hadn't really been thinking about my future, but it was my senior year that I took a class, um, which was introduction to either it was called biomechanics or human movement control or hu human motor control, something like that. But it was taught by Scott Delp, um, who was at the time at Northwestern. Um, and it just blew me away. I was like, wow, this is what engineering is for. This is why I'm here. This is what I want to do. And so I really just fell in love with the idea of engineering in human um, movement, human health, um, and so, you know, it was a really big um, kind of connection moment for me where I hadn't really thought, um, why was I doing this before? So after college, I decided I wanted to go get a master's. <clears throat> and at that time, looking around, I decided I wanted to study neural prostheses. So at Northwestern, I was kind of peripherally interested in prosthetics um, and there was work going on in, in the Chicago campus. But I got interested in neural prostheses, so I went to Case Western Reserve University, where they had a really great functional electrical stimulation program. Um, so I, I went there right after college, and I started my master's with Ron Triolo, which was a fantastic experience. It was um, my role there was studying um, implanted electrodes in the trunk muscles, uh, which were a part of a, a larger system for 
standing transfers and um, exercise for people who have spinal cord injury. But my role was really just studying the role of those trunk extensor electrodes on workspace during sitting. So I was looking at, um, you know, how does turning on the stimulation affect the upper extremity workspace sitting in a wheelchair? So I got, you know, a lot of exposure and experience with clinical research. I learned a ton about neurophysiology and um, electrodes and how, you know, how implanted electrodes work. And I learned a lot about motion capture systems and EMG systems and was using all of that for my master's thesis. And by the end of it, um, of course, next question, what happens next? That was around the time I got married and my husband had moved to Cleveland as well to go to business school at Case Western. So we were going to stay there. And so I started, I, I basically graduated from that lab and then stayed in the lab as a research engineer, rehabilitation engineer, um, working with the research uh, studies that were going on. So, you know, running them, you know, working on the equipment. Um, it was just a blast. It was great. I just really loved working with people. I got to meet their families. We developed relationships. It was weekly visits at, you know, many points in time. So it was just a really great mix of um, being with people, um, thinking about engineering, thinking about healthcare. Um, and science, you know, all kind of wrapped up together. Um, so I did that for two years. And then my husband was graduating and we were thinking, you know, what to do, what to do. And it so happened that Scott had come back to Case Western to give a lecture in one of our uh, meeting series. And I was like, oh, maybe I should see if, um, and by then Scott was at Stanford. Um, and I thought, well, maybe I should see if he needs help in a lab. You know, maybe he he needs an engineer in his lab. So I went up to him after the talk and I reintroduced myself and I was glad to know that he remembered me. And he said, well, I don't have anything in my lab, but there's some there's a new uh, professor at Stanford who's starting up. Maybe he needs help. And so sure enough, um, he did need help. And my husband and I ended up moving out to California and I continued kind of as a rehab engineer, research engineer um, in my new um, boss's lab, and his name is Terry Sanger. Um, he is a pediatric neurologist and an electrical engineer, um, and he was working on pediatric movement disorders. So this was a, a kind of a new experience um, working, learning a little bit more about pediatric disorders, um, congenital uh, uh, conditions, um, a whole new learning kind of in um, science and, you know, related medicine. Um, so I was working there in, in the lab, kind of managing the lab um, for a couple of years. We also, um, well, it was actually Scott's lab that had the, the motion analysis system, but we use that frequently. Um, I was kind of busy building little tools that we can use for experiments, running them, now working with kids and, and learning uh, to work with their families. Um, and after a couple of years of that, I thought, well, I really love this. I love research. If I'm going to do this for real, I need to get a PhD. Um, it's going to be really hard for me to do this, you know, if I don't. So um, I applied at Stanford for my PhD and I, I got in and I began two years after we got there. So I, you know, I started working there on my PhD. Um, it was in pediatric movement disorders, specifically in dystonia, secondary dystonia in kids which is a very tricky, um, a challenging disorder to understand. It presents itself so differently in different children. And um, we were trying to look and characterize their muscle activity patterns in the upper arm um, and under different circumstances. So as a part of that, you know, uh, you, there were so many things you had to build because there weren't ready machines that these kids could actually fit their arms into because of contractors, because of uh, spasticity and um, because of dystonia. So we had to build a lot of machinery. So it was kind of up close and personal with robotics. And I ended up studying a lot of robotics at Stanford then to, to figure out how to make that work. Um, and so it was really exciting. It was interesting um, and it was going well. There was a point in the middle, I, had, I got pregnant with my first kid um, and it was a you know, obviously a joyful moment for me, but um, there was a big question about whether 
there would be funding for me when I got back from having this child. So I applied for um, some grants before my leave and I just sort of crossed my fingers and I went, you know, home to have the baby. And fortunately for me, I think um, a, a grant did come through and I was funded by um, Cerebral Palsy International Research Foundation to complete my the work that I was doing for my PhD. Um, so I came back, I finished it, and um, by the end of my PhD, I was pregnant with my second child. Um, that was three years later. Um, and I was in the middle of kind of figuring out what I wanted to do in terms of postdocs. And I have to say, I, I feel really fortunate because I did identify, I inter interviewed at a few places, and I identified that I wanted to come to NIH, to the clinical center, to do my postdoc with Diane Damiano. And um, she was in the, she, she was the head of the um, motion lab at, in the rehab department there. And I was just really fortunate that once she found out, once I found out I was pregnant and I told her, she just said, okay, well, just come next year. Just have the baby, take, take, a, take a few months and just come next year. So she sort of extended the invitation to come and do a postdoc, which was really um unexpected, super welcome. It gave me a little bit of time to organize myself. Um, and so that, you know, that happened. We moved to Maryland um, to come to NIH for my postdoc. Um, and I started there in her lab, um, kind of mixing together the human motor control section of Dr. Mark Hallett, who uh, is an, an adult neurologist and had a big uh, neurophysiology lab um, at NIH dating back to when I was in grade school. You know, he had been there since the early 80s. Mer merging his lab with Diane's lab in, which was the rehab medicine department, um, functional and applied biomechanics. So um, she worked with pediatrics with, with kids and he, you know, he worked with neurophysiology and I was sort of something kind of in common between them. So it allowed those labs to um, collaborate a little, it allowed me also the mentorship from two different places. So I learned a little further about um, transcranial magnetic stimulation, um, EEG, and other um, non-invasive neurophysiology method methods from that experience, kind of bringing that all towards the the kids that um, were coming into Diane's lab. Um, it was a tremendous opportunity. It was probably the most uh, resource intensive place I've ever worked. I mean, you want MRI scans? All right, there's MRI down the hallway. You want this? Go there, get it. Everything, it just seemed free. You know, it was it was just like, um, dream it up, make a good argument, see if we can get approval, and then you can do something. It was, I didn't realize until later how spoiled I really was at that stage because the next thing I did was then apply for my assistant professor positions, you know, after the postdoc. And um, I'll say I had my third child. So I was pregnant at the end of my postdoc with my third child and applying for um, my next position. And it was tough at that point to find a place. Well, now with three kids, you know, the, and the, the oldest one was by then six or so. He's in school and um, just hard to move around. Um, so I was really looking for places in Maryland, D.C., you know, where could I drive from where we live? Um, I think super lucky. I mean, I, I probably will say that a lot. I feel very fortunate throughout this whole pathway, but around the same time I was looking for a job, the Catholic University of America in DC was looking for an assistant professor and someone who is interested in um, human motor control and preferably pediatrics. And I was like, oh my, that sounds great, yes. Um, so I, I, you know, applied there and I, I got accepted um, to join them. Um, I had the baby waited uh, to join like mid year. So I think I started like January semester, you know, winter, winter time, um, because my daughter was born in October. But then I, I started there as an assistant professor. And I realized what the NIH really was, the clinical center really provided, we had no resources where I was. We had um, we had no medical school. So it sounds familiar from what we've heard before. 
there was a nursing school, but it, it wasn't, there wasn't a facility that they worked in. So everything I had to reimagine, what would I want to do with research um, and start to develop collaborations with Children's National, which was a hospital kind of nearby across the street, but hadn't really, there wasn't a pre-existing relationship there. So I spent those first, you know, five years working really hard to try to make research happen um, the way that I wanted to do it. But at the same time, you know, teaching a lot, uh, there was a huge teaching load. Um, for the first time in years, I was thinking about stress strain curves because I had to teach them. So it's almost like I had to go back to college and remember, you know, mechanics and materials and all these topics. And senior design was fun because it got to bring in um, you know, meaningful healthcare related um, projects that students could work on. But it was it was like going back to college for me in some sense, because I had to start teaching classes that I hadn't been thinking about it's statistics, you know, basic statistics that you you kind of have to refresh your memory. But uh, so the experience was tremendous. I found that I loved teaching. Um, I really I loved my department mates. Um, but the the lifestyle, the requirements, what it took out of me was just uh, too much. And I found that it was more taking more than what it was providing me back in joy or, you know, excitement. And I was slowly, you know, deflating and losing, losing energy. And it was just a point that was very difficult in my career to look myself in the eye in the mirror and say, is this really what you want? Um can you see life in a different way, you know, and figure out what I wanted to do. So I decided um, that this path was no longer for me. It wasn't energizing me. It wasn't bringing the best out in me. So I left. Um, I, you know, I staged it, you know, I, I left kind of slowly, but I did, I left and I didn't yet know what I was going to do. So I took, um, about nine months at home, just trying to figure it out. I thought about science writing. I thought about, I thought about a ton of things. And the thing that worked that, um, that made sense to me that I started to really get excited about was to become a program director at NIH. So I joined NINDS, Neurological Disorders and Stroke, as a program director of neural engineering. Um, and so that was about five and a half years ago. Um, and I, you know, I, I, it was, a, it was a whole new world. It took a year or so to like get my feet under me, but I started to get the hang of it and really enjoy it. Um, and so I've been at NIH since, um, I made this switch last year, about a year ago, um, just a new opportunity and something I realized that every step that I've been moving away from the research lab, it's kind of been a broadening, like the meaning, the topics that I'm working with are just getting a little bit broader and broader and broader. Um, so that is just something I'll mention if any of you here are considering a shift to administration. Um, what, what I see is that it's still compelling, it's interesting, I love the mission, and but you're, you're so far from doing the science, you know, at a certain point that um, it's, it's nice now and then when you get to go to conferences and you talk to you know talk to the PIs that are you're working with, talk to the trainees you're working with, um, it kind of is like a re-injection of that energy and um, that kind of uh, mentality that um, is a little bit different in academia from government work. So here I am now, nice to uh, share with you and I yeah, look forward to hearing more from you. Awesome. Um, thank you so much uh, to all of you for those introductions. They're some really interesting career paths. Um, it's looking like we do have time for a few questions. So I'll open up the floor if folks want to raise their hand or put questions into the chat. Um, while folks are coming up with questions, um, I have one which is just kind of is there a, a soft skill or a non-technical skill that you think has been incredibly important to the path that you've gone on, whether it's um, kind of people skills or management? That is a great question. I could start off by saying, I think, smiling and critical thinking. <laughs> okay. Those would be my two. I'd love to hear what others think. 
Yeah, I was just going to say kind of a common theme with all of us. Um, I don't know if it's necessarily skill, but just um, making those connections. I think having a connection in the field is really important. Like I know a few of the other speakers got jobs off of um, just talking, being open and willing to talk to others and your uh, mentors. And they might not necessarily have something for you, but they know someone who knows someone. Um, you might have an opportunity. So yeah, just keeping the doors open and making those connections. Yeah, I think one of the hardest things initially for me was making those connections, talking to people. Initially, and, and Ginger will probably say what? And so Anna is, I was an introvert. <laughs> um, and being able to go up to talk to people at conferences or any of these things or even interviewing is really hard, right? Until you get a lot of practice doing that and talking to folks. And I think as you mature in life and having to do more and more things, you end up having to learn how to network. It's not something that we're trained. We, we, there's, I don't think, does anybody ever had a class in how to network? Or how to like socialize? It's 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 pretty tough because we don't get that formal training yet. That's an integral part of all of this in order to get promoted and such. I was just at a a women in STEM conference two weeks ago, and a woman from who was a an engineer at Northrop Grumman, and she was just like putting her head down and working really hard. And she was like, "How come I'm not getting promoted?" And she went to a women in engineering event there and they're like, you need to self-promote yourself. You need to speak up in those meetings and tell people like what your ideas are, because otherwise they think you have no ideas. Um, so it is important. And one thing I remember reading as an assistant professor was when somebody asks you, um, how are you doing? Like, hey, how's it going? You just say, oh, it's great. No, don't do that. You actually have to tell them like, oh, you know what? I just submitted a grant proposal or I just graduated a student or I bought out of her. Just tell them a little bit other than just keep your head down and keep walking. I'll just add a quick one to um, introspection. And I think that that's something that I wish that I did more of earlier but just, am I where I want to be? Like, am I, who am I doing this for? Am I doing this for me or am I doing this because I think it's supposed to be what I'm doing or for somebody else? So check in with yourself. That skill helps. Um, I actually do have a quick question. Um, so regarding the CLIMB lab, um, the Center for Lean Loss and Mobility, I want to, because that's something I do consider um, following in the future, like maybe doing a postdoc and then doing a faculty um, working with the same kind of population. Um, but I'm an international student, so I wanted to know if there are any certain limitations for like getting a postdoc from U.S. citizens or um, from international students. Yeah, I don't have the specific answer. Um, I, we have had international students before, um, so I know that is possible. Um, I don't know the specifics on like visas or um, how you have to be associated with what, but I know there are, that is possible. Okay. And we have definitely had several international students. Um, I want to say most of them were doing PhD or, or master's or graduate work. So they were affiliated with the University of Washington. Um, but yeah, I'm sure there's. Yeah, I think if I would do a postdoc, I would still be affiliated with the universities. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, you can definitely reach out and I can get you in contact with. Okay, thank you. Hi. Principal investigator would have those answers. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Yeah, thanks. Um, I'm looking at the time, and I want to be respectful of everyone's time. So, um, let's thank our panelists for sharing their career paths and experiences with us. And then I'm sure they'd be more than happy um, to answer questions offline by email um, if folks have more. So, thank you. Um, I'm also happy to answer. There was a question in the chat. Yeah, I guess while folks are kind of, if folks are still around, um, for specifically Krista, when you became lab manager, was it, 
how was it as kind of changing your role um, or if it was something that you sort of built so that you could manage, help the lab function better, I guess. Yeah, it was actually a previous role. Um, so Ava Siegel was my predecessor um, and she was a wonderful mentor to me as well. Um, so she had the, I'm not exactly sure how the lab manager role came about, but I think it was because so many as the center grew, so many different groups were using the lab space um, for different things. So they kind of needed one point person to help manage all the equipment. So when you're talking to all the vendors of the equipment and um, troubleshooting, it's helpful to kind of have just one point person and one person to kind of um, put together like training documents and how to use all the equipment. And if anything goes wrong, you know who to go to. Um, so I think that was kind of the idea of creating that role, um, just having a main point of contact and somebody who's checking in with the lab space and making sure everything's running smoothly with so many people using it. Um, so I kind of took over her role when she left the group. Um, and then where does one start something like that? <laughs> yeah, so that is an interesting question. Um, and kind of, I didn't give too much of my background in school, but, um, I kind of thought I wanted to go into nursing school or medical field as well um, in high school. And my physics teacher and math teachers actually pushed me into engineering. Um, they were kind of my advocates. There wasn't a lot of women in um, the engineering field either. And I really had, knew nothing about engineering. I kind of thought it was all like mechanics or electrical. Um, so yeah, I was, didn't even realize there was this whole biomechanics or biomedical engineering side. Um, so they kind of pushed me into that. And then like someone else had mentioned, there was a class um, intro to biomechanics that kind of really opened my eyes up to that field. Um, I kind of through some other people got to tour a motion analysis lab in my undergrad and thought that was really cool. And that's kind of where I wanted to be. I knew I didn't really want to teach. Um, but I did want to do that research side and emotion analysis lab. So I got really lucky about um, finding this job. Again, it was kind of through my husband's, um, he did a postdoc at DU in Denver and his mentor knew somebody here at the center, kind of got me into talking with them and found this job that way. So yeah, it's all about connections. And I was really lucky to kind of find this perfect job where I didn't have to necessarily teach, but I got to work in an emotion analysis lab and do the research under the principal investigator. So yeah, kind of a long-winded answer there. <laughs> Thank you so much. All right. Thank you all. <laughs>